Got Oliver, it. welcome. Kia, how are you, bro? I'm all right. You know, um, I can't remember the last time we actually spoke, like, not in, not via text. Spoke, it's been a spoke, spoke off WhatsApp. It's probably Japan, wasn't it? Fine. That's almost like three and a half years, four years. That's outrageous when you think about it. That goes fast, isn't it? You weren't in a particularly good place, were you? When the last time I spoke, there, there was murder on the cards. Oh, yeah. I mean, what? If this is in Japan or my in personal Japan, life? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Take your pick. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, no. Same thing. You, you ended up doing, was it one year or two years more than me? I had four total. So, what do you? You, you, you did one before me and, and one yeah. after. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I always yeah, yeah. thought that you um, you had a much sweeter oh, sound mate, than I did. Great, yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's some, some sort of rumblings under the under the water like there was a lot of stuff going on and like you would have found there isn't a whole lot of face-to-face uh honestly going on but in general it's, it's especially compared to sort of what you had gone through well mate, mm-hmm. i had a great time i, I loved yeah. it we, 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 Kubota was a great company um we did some like significant things with the team towards the end we couldn't quite under, like like uh, with a like my ceo hat, hat on like in the team what do you really want you want your head coach and your head of you know head of performance pretty fucking tight and me and Fran, yeah. yeah me and Franz Ludica were like almost on the same page about every single aspect of everything like, oh, yeah <laughs> we set it. Set, we've got it at last we've got it and yeah, uh, yeah the Japanese GM wanted he just wanted to make a change and we were like well what does that mean well, I just yeah. want to make a change and then just didn't renew my contract off the back of that and uh so is that like I wasn't bitter, bitter leaving because I think you know everything's you know everything happens for a reason. It's a little bit, a little bit hippie, but it was probably the right time to get the kids back. And uh, I was a little bit japanned out, which I think you'll understand that that concept. I was after um, six months. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did four years. I, I did. No, I didn't grind it out. I didn't grind. It. We had a great time. Kids love the kids. They, they sort of want to go back, but um, hmm. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not that keen on. Uh, you have, on you have four children, correct? They're three, three, yeah, three, three. three. I guess it's so. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was expensive. Yeah, um, yeah. Obviously, they, they have to be in. Well, they don't have to be in um, international school. But if I actually want them to have any kind of education, I think learning English is probably more conducive for them. Um, yeah. yeah, it got yeah, it got got a bit expensive. But oh, mate, we had a great time. Love, love Japan. Look, the players were the players were were brilliant to work with because yeah. they were just. They were just down. They were like, yeah, whatever. Oh, is that it? Is that all you want us to do? I want to do more. But now, <laughs> we're good. And we made a change. Like, you know, we've chatted a couple of times about it. We, Or you, you, you know, as performance coaches, you want to evoke change. Like, what's the fucking point if you're not doing something? And yeah. after a point, evoking change in the gym becomes a little bit, like, boring for you. That, like, that's you to me. That, that, to do it. That, that is where, you know, two, two things I noticed is, is obviously the, the gap between our respective sides. The whole time I was there was closing, closing, closing. Thank fuck I left yeah. before you beat us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I never got I over left. you, did I? Yeah, yeah, I, never, yeah. I never got a win over you. Yeah, when the year I left, you guys made the playoffs. And you, you had your yeah. best run. But it, it was one of those things where, for me, you kind of like opened my eyes. I, I, I consider you and John Pryor to be like, want the, the filters for Franz Bosch and well I just stole all John's stuff so well, really, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm filtering his stuff yeah I took a lot from you too in terms yeah. of you know trying to to improve performance on the field like you said and that seems to be one of the things where bro I'd be looking out the corner of my like your match day warmers for like, oh, <laughs> that. but that was I, I did uh, I did take that from you and it, it, I find it interesting because you know, you came up during the heyday of Leicester Tigers. Mm. And I should say, for anyone listening to this, it was it was bizarre. You and I probably grew up an hour from each other. Yeah, and like never, never met in England. Yeah. Worked in Australia at the same time. Never met yeah, in Australia. Crazy. And we ended they up don't really understand that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so how do you yeah. do do you find that quite just a, an interesting contrast that you know famously Leicester Tigers program of physical preparation back in the day was so stripped back like correct me if i'm wrong like press, nah, very, press, very, very, uh, yeah that, that pull down and row and that was it right yeah. but yeah so me alex martin was the head of snc when i was there for for 
a period of, we had we had quite a lot of you know, so I started there as an intern so I started no I no fucking idea what's going on started yeah. there had I can't remember his name I a South African guy was over he left someone else came in like I'd, I'd had a few experiences and Craig White came in was obviously quite a big big uh, influence on me and still good good friends with him now uh, Craig left. And then, uh, yeah, I think Alex took over and we did so much rugby at Leicester. Yeah. We did more rugby than any of the, any of the other teams in the league. Mm-hmm. And it, when we reasoned it out, it sort of made a lot of sense. We're doing all of this specific stuff. Well, let's just try and affect some physiology. Me and Al never, and he would, he would say this as well, we never completely agreed on the way, that, you know, the way it was going. But he was the boss and I was happy to, you know, yeah. experiment with the programme. And... The, the biggest frustration at Leicester is, at the time, is they were so fucking good. We never really knew what we never really knew if we were affecting change or not. We had like, I don't know, seventeen internationals in the squad or something. So, <laughs> yeah. L- later on, um, Damien Damien Marsh gave me the phrase, "Oh, you could have played Monopoly with them and you still would have final." Do you know what I mean? Like, it's, <laughs> you know, we could have done anything, but we we, we it really we used to sit in the office. For hours and hours and hours debating and pulling apart the program and you know mm. just having thought experiments going down one road of complete specificity and then the opposite and stuff and it was a real it was a real like um breeding ground for us forming our ideas on stuff and, and i forgot at the time like sometimes you're like come on i don't want to get out of here but th- those those hours we spent just debating shit for the sake of de- debating it it was um it helped it's helped me in the long term i think that was one thing that, you know, I, I didn't know you or anyone in that program at that time, but you, you kind of hear the rumors. Yeah. And when you're, when you're coming up, you're, well, this is important. This is important. This is important. But then you have an example, a couple of yeah. hours up the road where, no, it's not, no, it's not like you said, yeah. it's like my, my impression is it, it shows how unimportant it is. And if, if all the rugby is in place and the, the cultural elements. Do you- but we know that we've come, it took, it took us years and years to get to that point. Like, yeah, and and now even now, if I if I'm honest with, if someone employs me, what do I bring? It would be a lot of conversation about the rugby program, and, and the the first thing the first thing I go into battle about is the schedule. I can't even consider what's happening in the gym until we've got the schedule right, and we understand what everything means on the schedule. And once mm. we've got that right, okay, right, we have a common language. We know what we're trying to do. We know what's happening on this day. And if you go. If we, if I'm talking speed days and you you want to flog people, we, we know that we don't need to have that conversation because we know that doesn't fit right. That's not fit. That doesn't fit in our day principle. Um, and yeah, before I worry about squats or leg presses or you know, it gives a fuck. Just you know, just start. <laughs> what um, are, there, are there any kind of intangibles or, or things that you think they did? purposefully to to create that aura around that because you guys i want to say you made the, the national final eight years out of ten mate when i first i thought i was yeah. amazing when i yeah. first started i did not make a final i think for <laughs> seven or eight years in a row i was like this, yeah. is, this is easy yeah because there was um, the there, one, there are, there are, there was like there are hard as leicester were hard as fucking that in that time yeah. they're tough man we hit more scrums than anyone we did more contact than anyone and you know the boys moaned and we had a few battles with you know coaches and players and stuff and we had quite high coach turnover during that time but we had a very very strong core when I first got there we had just the most ridiculous core of senior players Martin mm-hmm. Johnson Martin Curry Graham Roundtree Austin Healy it was ben like Kay. was Ben Kay there fucking Ben Kay everyone everyone that was anyone in sort of rugby was around there yeah. in, in the UK at least and then we you know we could we were a relatively well-off club that Bought good foreign players, and we had the two Alangi family, like in in our pocket, like they were they were only playing for us. Um, yeah, it was you know they, they were tough though. They were very. It was a very very tough rugby training. Very yeah. tough. There was scrapping. Like when I first got there, there was scrap daily scraps in training because the the contact was so high. And you know what it's like. It's like oh, I'm gonna do it at this level, and someone hits a little bit harder, and then someone hits a little bit harder, and next minute you've like everyone's. <laughs> yeah, but here's, here's um, the thing about that stuff having seen that in college football mm. there is that in college football but it's all posturing and yeah. my my opinion about that is if you're going to do it just fucking, go fucking have yeah. a fight and get it square out of up or don't, or square up. don't square up and not do anything yeah 
You may as well, you just go. You may as well. They, they, they want to be pulled back, whereas it's like, yeah. well, no, if, yeah. you're gonna fucking, if you're going to start, you yeah, have to go. see it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, just go. No, there was some tough, tough, and, and we had a team full of men. Do you know what I mean? There was a lot of like, hmm. there was a lot of 30 year old to 35 year olds. When I first started, there was a lot of that sort of, you know, seasoned, gnarly, tough motherfuckers in that team. Yeah. And, um, and we did good on that, right? You know, obviously, you have to, those, the quadrant of those players leave and you have to make sure that the, the, the quadrant next to them is coming through and what have you. And I think we recruited pretty well. Yeah, it was yeah, it was just good, good times. I completely over um, inflated my idea of what we did as S and C coaching. How easy this game was. I was like, fucking, all right. Oh, you mean people don't win the championship? <laughs> really? <laughs> that must suck. I've just remembered as well. You uh, you coached the Scherzer as well. Yeah, Marcus, yeah, yeah, Marcus, yeah, yeah, Marcus, yeah. Marcus, yeah. Marcus, that sums it up. He is just yeah. like a quiet, yeah. tough, yeah, yeah. tough man. It's tough though, right? It's just, he's a yeah. wagon of a man. He's just like a breeze block, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, and, and you know what if you they prided themselves on our set piece and our scrum and how tough we were and it it, it really helps you, you know you get your set piece right and you and you lean into how important it is and you like make it your thing it's Don't give you, away know, it's and... you know south africans have done it for years haven't they you know and they, they've been successful with it the, the the mark of that team is we had so many different head coaches i think we had five in five years or something and really we're still but we had um the Argentinian... Uh, yes, you had El Tano Lofreda. Lofreda, yeah. right? Fucking no idea what he was doing. <laughs> <laughs> no idea what he was doing. He didn't know the. He didn't know which position the players played. He like alienated half the squad in about forty minutes, and I think we final that year. It was like we couldn't help, but we were too. The yeah. players were too good to to, to fuck it up. Really lovely, <laughs> lovely, lovely man. It's gone from. <laughs> Had gone from just having that team, like the Argentinian team, just had them, didn't he? And then he, I think, you know, he came home and he didn't get them. And if you know, it's an intangible again. But if you don't, if you haven't got them, you know, it's the he same was, for um, us. He was us. very, if we haven't, yeah, yeah. If we haven't got them, he, he I was, can put the best programs in place, but I need them to believe in me, not not the program. He was, um, he was very functional in that. 2007 team that came out like third but he had like the perfect combination he's in the union right now he's working for the pumas but he had that like you said that linking of players and like sort yeah. of like mystic around it and they had yeah. a golden era so it was just like the right piece for the right flow yeah that exactly. group of players didn't need you know a leader just needed someone to just to put them all together like if you want to say yeah. it spiritually or mentally and then you just go just try not to mess it up where if you get a coach that has a huge presence and tries to like you know dog fight it with whoever the leader players are, then you're in a problem and then you just fuck it up. So just don't yeah, mess it yeah. up, you know. Like yeah, it is yeah. Uh, I think he got paid for three years after he left, so I think he, I think he did all right out of it. That's like uh, uh, that's the rumor around here. College, like he got sport, college, like the best sport, thing that happened is just he got yeah. Fired I think he's still he's being still... paid. Probably. Dude, there's a there's a coach <laughs> in college football. He's at FAU now. He is still being paid by three different teams. His buyout at Florida State was 20 million. It's worth had... doing a bad job in it just to get a payout. I've been waiting for a payout. I've been trying yeah. to do a shit job for years. Just can't <laughs> You're just doing it wrong, mate. You're just doing no. it wrong. Just, just take all like you know the lawsuits and whatnot and just drag them around. Four yeah. paychecks. Just one of them, one of them would set me up. <laughs> yeah. I, um... No, it was good, 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 good times. And um, I look, I, look, I'm from Leicester, do you know what I mean? Like I was on the terraces when they, when I was 11, watching them play on the crumbly stand, you know, it was a bit of a dream come true. Um, and it was good. Why leave? It was a... So why, why leave? You know, like, I, 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 I like... yeah, like, I, I want to, well, two, two little things, two little things. Yeah. One, um, when, Craig White left. Yeah. Pretty sure when Craig left. So me and Alex were the two sort of senior S C coaches underneath, underneath Craig. Both got on really great, whatever. Very, very good, good friends with Alex, but quite different personalities. Um, and we we're both sort of like, well, I, I want to be, I want to be the boss. And yeah. uh, and then we sort of sort of came to the uh, agreement that I would do the Saxons. Uh, and Alex would, you know, Alex would be the boss, and they sort of leveraged me not being too shitty with them that Alex was the boss and I wasn't by letting me do the Saxons, which again was a wicked experience. And um, 
I, you know, I learned quite a lot about touring and uh, and um, sort of trans, in, intercontinental travel and what have you from that. And that was the way it was, but that wasn't going to change. Like Alex was, he was good. He was really good. I thought he was really, really good and lived it and, you know, was successful. And fucking, this always happens to me, but it seemed, it seemed random, but create, Dean Benton had been over. Dean Benton had come over and he was, he was coaching at, at Leicester as head, head of athletic performance and we did not get on very well at all. Like, did not get on. <laughs> we're very, we get on really, really well now. I, 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 I respect him very highly. And um, him what and John. What was the issue at the time? Like, we were Leicester. So we did it, we did it the Leicester way, right? The music's cranked up. It's the like working sniffing, with every the fucking sniffing salt with rugby. You can't tell them anything. Yeah, the, sn- <laughs> the sniffing salts are out. The, the music was cranked up. We lifted heavy and we did loads yeah. of rugby. And that's what we did. And looking back now i completely understand where he was coming from he he was one of the first guys that was moving towards athletic performance not strength and conditioning you know yeah. there's a, the nuance in there that i think we all of us on the call understand but he was the first one that was bothered about running mechanics he was the first one that was you know bothered about structured recovery sessions and you don't fucking talk your way out of it and we do we do one-on-one stretching routines or whatever but he, he was looking at much, much more holistically than we were doing it and we were just like and he's australian so he came in a fucking mate that's fucking bullshit that's fucking bullshit <laughs> and we were just like who the fuck's this and then we just think i'm like with me and him had shouting matches like fucking proper shouting at each other and it wasn't mm. until i left uh, until he left and then i think i left and then we reconnected and we just get on good like we just see it we see it much more similarly now. And yeah. and he got me to the Reds. Like Damien Marsh was recruiting. He wanted um, he wanted someone in the rehab strength. He wanted a bit of wrestling type work in there. And like Dean recommended me. I was like, Dean Benton recommended <laughs> me. And I was like, yeah. So we had like, I don't know, fucking 45 minute chat. I spoke to you and Mackenzie for 45 minutes and I was on the plane in five and a half weeks and I was over there and really? working for the Reds and it was like, you know, I can't tell you how many times previous to that I'd like Googled Australian super rugby teams. Like, oh, how the fuck do I get in there? Like I just, how do I get through my foot through the door? And I knew, I knew Jim Mackay who was over there, but he was working, I think he was working at the academy. Um, no, sorry. No, he was with the, he was with the senior team, but, he wasn't, he wasn't, he was a backs coach. He wasn't in position to be recruiting. And I think I'd messaged him a couple of times, like, Jimmy, if anything ever crops up, man, I'd love to be in, you know, I'd love to be out there or whatever. But he couldn't really make anything happen. And then this just seemingly randomly happened and, mate, we're over there in, yeah, six weeks, bounced to Brisbane, took the whole family. I think we'd had our, we'd had our, I think Jacob, my second kid was like, six weeks old or something wow. and my wife is like all right then go on then let's go and we just is, is that there. something you discuss because obviously you know i i'm sure leicester and northampton are similar in that regard whereas if if you are from leicester or northampton those are rugby towns if mm. you play or you're associated with those clubs you're like famous in your hometown and you've experienced all that success it would be very understandable for you to want to stay in that environment forever but by the sounds of it you're always kind of like nah you know, fuck that's not you and i are in that regard no, you're always looking outwards to something else like oh what's next what's yeah. next what's next yeah yeah so yes yeah, opposite i'm exactly like that and I've, i have to rein that in so i have to rein that in bad because i'll be like, I'll be like two minutes somewhere and i'll be looking at, at like, like what's that over there and you know and i know that to make to make things work, there has to be a level of consistency and, uh, and there has to be a level of stability. And when you're, when you're like, eyes are looking elsewhere all the time. It's like how you maintain a relationship, right? Yeah. Fucking don't, yeah. Don't keep looking too much. We'll yeah. get distracted. <laughs> I, I but, think, um, it's, you know, like you said, it's like you're, I've never met your wife. I don't I maybe admit, I can't remember if I met your wife once, but like, yeah, yeah maybe in Japan. Yeah, I'm my, sure. I think it takes a special kind of partner to, yeah, she, to handle could, that. G as well like so then we had another kid and we're in Japan and she was just like three times a year just bouncing Japan to England with three kids on her own and we ain't wow. talking first class or business we're talking cat work she's in the back in the cattle yeah. most of the time I've done it with yeah. one one-year-old and yeah. I would not do it again <laughs> crazy and she just does it yeah you know she just does it and she's yeah it, it takes I can see like I remember 
years and years ago, some a friend of mine, I think, I can't actually remember who it was, but they had an opportunity in Australia and he was like, oh, my wife won't go. And I was mm. like, what? It's Australia. Yeah, and, and your wife. <laughs> she just won't go. I'm like, oh, sucks to be you. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. No, no, <laughs> fair play to it. It take, takes a bit to get done. Yeah. What, what prompted uh, the end? Because, uh, you know, my impression is you, you could have kept doing this as long as you wanted to, like with, with your resume and everywhere you've been. You've been completely, off, right? completely. The, uh, um, the pandemic, really. And, and as it turns out, it's been more of a pause than a, than a complete end. But I was uh, so at the end of Japan, that was the first time I'd not had my contract renewed. And I was like, well, I feel like I was fucking doing pretty good. Like, what the oh, fuck? Oh, you were, yeah. <laughs> and uh, you know what it's like. I'm out of the cycle. So now I'm leaving Japan and everybody is sorted for staff. I'm like, my fucking phone is on the desk. I'm like, I've got lots of contacts in this game and my phone is not <laughs> at all. Yeah. Nothing. Nothing. And I'm like, oh shit, H hold on. I'm like, nah, someone will call. Like, mate, I was hitting, oh, hey, hey, mate, <laughs> how you doing? You're all right. How's everything going? Yeah. Like to every, every rugby person I knew and nothing, dead. Uh, just waited it out. I was like, nah, something will, something will come up, something will come up. And then I don't even know how Huddersfield Giants came up, but the Giants in the Super League, yeah, how did that come up? Anyway, the Super League, League is a tough environment. Yeah, mate, I tell you what, it was really tough. And we, I got off to a really bad start with them because I came in mid season mm. and I tried to, I just, they, they were just like, kind of shit and they had some good players and they just tried to make some change and they just got it a little bit wrong too fast too much too soon yeah. uh, alienated a couple of senior players we had to you know and then we had a couple of meetings and i just explained what i was trying to do and we basically got to the end of the year and then mate i fucking nailed that pre-season honestly i would i would not talk myself up if i didn't and it just went right and I got everyone on board and they all believed in what we we're doing and we weren't particularly well coached we had a very good assistant coach we had a very young head coach had come over from Newcastle Knights, um, ex NRL player, bit bit raw, bit raw as a coach. Kind of thought he was still a bit of the player, like was always you know out the piss with the lads and uh, whatever. It was a bit bit difficult. But mate, by the time the pandemic hit, we were top of the Super League. We just turned over St Helens, and I was like, the fucking system works. It, it really, it really does work. And and the boys were invested, and it, it, everything shut down. And I was like. So we started Full Reptile when I was in, in Japan as a MMA MMA based. Um, well, is it a few few strings to it, but basically we have a YouTube channel, um, Full Reptile YouTube channel that Dan Hardy does a load of breakdown work on. Me and him have a podcast on. Um, up until the point Dan was released by the UFC, we had our, we had our media guys out of pretty much every one of the UFCs doing backstage stuff and and interviews and what have you. Well, so I that's. Mean the most the most important aspect of this channel is it is a vehicle for judo jimmy woolhead yeah well now <laughs> now us uncensored has raised its ugly head and is part of the channel it's awesome. well. yeah it's, you know, mate, it's, it's, it's pretty funny so anyway we started that and then during the pandemic i was just like well i can you know do i really want to go back and do that or do i want to invest in the long game the long game you know is building something that that we're in charge of and i'm not you know, Japan burnt me that I was like, like, it, but it actually burnt me subconsciously more than consciously. I was like, oh, yeah. you can just take the shit away from me whenever you want. <laughs> okay. I, I was that. actually thinking about this in a bar last night. And it's like, you, you see it all the time where you're, you're burnt by a system. And then your yeah. first instinct is to get back into the very same system yeah. that burnt you as soon as possible. It's like being a battered wife. You're like, oh, this time yeah. it's going to be different. It's like, whoa. What a lovely analogy. <laughs> the the um, Stock Stockholm Syndrome, is it? Like, yeah, you just yeah, get yeah. captured totally and just leave out. And you're like, yeah. actually, my, you know, yeah. my kidnapper was a nice dude. He just fed me every yeah. night. You know, every week. And... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> do, do you feel like... His heart, his heart was in the right place. <laughs> yeah. Do, do you feel for Dan that that was almost confirmation in a way that with with those products was it was it was it specifically the ufc or bt sport but you know now no, UFC, BT sport reptile, about it. yeah now um, that he has reptile it's like well actually you, you can't hurt me on the level we, that you like mate, to. we had the we had the conversation this morning just about something different about being being beholden to people and it's mm. just like fuck that no way it's yeah. just the, you know people that and i i have real 
I'm semi-conformist. Like if I think if I think you know what you're talking about and you ask yeah. me to do something, the chances are and it makes sense, I'll I'll do it. If I think yeah. you're full of shit, fuck yeah, now it's over. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm looking for another job. Like I, I'm yeah. I'm out. And I've, I just have that problem. Like I just I can't. And and yeah. at the at the red, you know, there's a couple of people in the, the and I was just like yeah, fucking full of shit. Man. It's full of shit. <laughs> and then the minute, the minute that ticks over in my head, my head, I'm gone. Like because yeah. I, ne- I never really see that turn around. Like I never see if someone's bullshitting me, and I'm like, I just, re- I just recognise you bullshitting me. That's basically it. There's no real way yeah. back. Um, I, I read a book. It's taken forever. It's, it's a big book. Like I think you'll like it. It's called The Sovereign Individual, and it's, yeah. it's, uh, you know, Peter Thiel. Who Peter Thiel is. Yeah. And yeah, so he actually paid for a reprinting of The Sovereign Individual. And it's like a crazy right wing libertarian book written by Jacob Rees Mogg's father. But wow. one of the things that the book goes on about is basically is to make the price of violence as high as possible. So mm-hmm. you want to position your way in such a life that you, people can't do violence against you. But the thing is, they, they expand the definition of violence as basically. Yeah somebody can impose their will upon you and you can't do anything about it. So yeah. you know very well, F- like physical violence, you have yeah. to prepare yourself against that. But then also social, political, yeah, yeah. economical, like all those I, I, Man, I, I, I worry for the kids that the, the level of social manipulation on, on you know, social media is, yeah. it's, it's vile. Vile, you can't, you, can, you know what I mean? You can't, you can't, Put your hand down the phone, drag them out, and headbutt them. You know what I mean? It's it's, it's worse than that. It's worse. Than people, you know, to have to to have to deal with it. So I never asked you this. I was just going to ask you a few random questions. Why did you yeah, become yeah. a vegan? I'm not a vegan anymore. It's fucking bullshit. <laughs> why Why did you become a vegan? Um. So I gave it a fucking good crack. I gave yeah. it. I gave it three three years ish. Pretty much gave it three years. Um, not, not. I, I, I don't think there's anything health wise in it uh, necessarily. It doesn't seem to make sense to me. There was, there's a, there's a moral, there's a moral conundrum that I couldn't get my head around, and I still, I still, depending on what we're doing, I, you know, I still, I, is it all right to treat conscious beings as a product? And yeah. I, I still, you know, I. I don't necessarily wrestle it day to day but it's still like if we we sat down and had that conversation it's a difficult conversation to have do you know what i mean and yeah. and and i get yeah, yeah that was the basis of it is it all right for me just for the te- just for my taste buds to be part of an industry that is using that sentient being or s- semi-sentient being as yeah. a product that was the, the the driving force behind it the health thing's fucking bullshit yeah unless well, like, if you hear sam harris sam harris talks about if once once you get to the point where manufactured meat uh yeah. offers the same health benefits as slaughtered meat you have a moral obligation yeah. to not right. consume animals but but you know i like i i guess you, yours was like a moral standpoint but then in my own head when i go the other way with it it's also that all um all organisms on earth tend to exist at the expense of other organisms yeah and the idea that suffering can be removed by not consuming animals animals in the wild die you know painful painful death. yeah 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 and, and it's going back to what you're saying about about sam is there isn't like we pretend there's a viable alternative at the minute but it's f- fucking miserable and yeah. it's you know and it doesn't give you the same nutrition um, so we're pretending that if we if we do get to that stage, then we're like you know well you know as a as a species we'll have to have a strong consideration about why what okay if there is a viral term now why am I why am I eating animals? Yeah. Does um, um, you know I'll I'll speak in hypotheticals given your uh, the visa process you're in right now, but do you yeah. feel like psychedelic drugs might tie into an awareness of your yeah. impact on the world and consciousness and stuff like that? Uh, I think so because. When non, like it's certainly in my experience, your everyday life for ninety nine percent of people that yeah. is fueled by processed carbs, caffeine, alcohol, nicotine is, I think, is like almost plastering in you to, to desensitize you to to you know what's going on in in the actually what's going on in the world and yeah. how connected you are to everything. 
and um, those who experiment with psychedelics and uh, and what have you tend to get that shattered really fucking quickly and it, then you're like you get oh. thrown over the garden wall <laughs> yeah like oh okay fuck <laughs> everything's connected so <laughs> Fernando, fernando's <laughs> smiling because i might have been trying to bully him into this yeah no no you know me so you knew you had to convince me logically with an argument i'll be like <laughs> oh, that'll oh, go. Yeah, you're that right log- that logic chat will go out the window room. <laughs> There's nothing is, logical it, that is it out. right is it right the i mean I'm, I'm guessing the full reptile thing is like associated with like psychedelics is, is, is it right as well that, that dan towards the end of his career or like when the end of his career was imposed upon him that kind of like lined up with him having psychedelic experiences and stuff like that um yeah dan, dan's been a psychonaut for years and years like he he enjoys it as part of um a, a, a part of his human experiences that he wants he, you know he craves to understand things you can see that in you know yeah. how he lives his life like he spends his life analyzing stuff um we we've been to peru together we went we went down to peru and uh, and sat and drank ayahuasca together and yeah and went through that fucking process uh which was, how was that <laughs> yeah it was it was it was it was rough it was mm. rough acutely um it was i'd, I'd go back and do it and I'd, I'd recommend it to, to people i'd recommend it and the more the more you feel like you're stuck in your life, the more I would uh, recommend it because it seems yeah. it, it, there's, a, there's there's a few levels to it. it. Seems to have a cleansing effect spiritually and and physically. Seems to you know there seems to be some sort of reset and control or delete, right? A, yeah, a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> um, it also if you're if you're stuck in patterns and you're stuck in addictions and you you just stuck in shitty ways, it seems to re, it seems to hit the reset button on that. And it also it also seems to give you a it just seems to double down your empathy like you just you feel you just feel a bit you know what I mean like you feel a lot of your relationships you feel the 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 opposite um, what they're feeling you I feel like I can understand people a little bit better it, it wears a little bit like you get you know I'm back in the cycle of a shitload of caffeine surrounded by a testosterone fuel fucking 20 year olds i was about to ask you that how do you how do you reconcile that against uh i'll I'll use it loosely warrior because obviously uh combat is that's like reptile brain yeah very very aggressive and being empathetic and kind of like trying to elevate your consciousness doesn't seem to uh yeah but 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 weirdly seems to go hand in hand in in another way right is is Some of the most prominent or out there uh, psychedelic users from fight sports, like the, the, they're probably the first guys to openly uh, admit. I yeah. think the 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 path of a uh, someone that fights, even if it's professionally or it's um, sort of, I guess socially for me, is a tough path. Like it's a tough, you, you know, you you are you are already facing yourself and who you are which is the yeah. you know which is what psychedelics do like it's a level I'm of scrutiny that most people don't get exposed to. yeah yeah but but i and then i have to come home and talk myself to go back in there because i know i have to look myself in the mirror and go nah fucking little bitch you have to go back in there and you get better and you don't have to beat everyone but you have to get better and that's what you yeah. have to do and, and that's a very similar it's a very similar like, looking in the mirror as you do with psychedelics you look in the mirror and but you go past the psychedelics and you're looking into like deep what what's within your thought processes and what's whether there's a soul or not i don't know but what's in like the what's deep in there and i i feel like that that's where the crossover is because whether some of our younger guys realize that's what they're doing or mm. not i believe that's what they're doing the, the path of the the path of a combat athlete is not for everyone because of the because of the self-reflection that you need to to, to get it done yeah because it's, there's no you know there's no one to rely on it's you i, I, I think like, it, it's oh. almost like I'll go, go ahead, Mary. I was going to say, I was just listening to Michael Bisping the other day, and yeah. I know fuck all about fighting, but I just, you know, love some British accents, lived myself in Wales for a while. And he was talking about this duality, like, that, that you're covering now. He said, like, a lot of people are gifted, athletic, but you just cannot win over just by using violence. Like, at some point where, you know, the most heated moments where you need this focus, where you need this calmness, and that comes yeah. from, like, that balance between... Uh, body and mind and that thing you're talking about so it's just like sort of like counterintuitive because so, it's survival but then you need that 
slow breathing, that focus. Yeah, just but to get the, it done, the guys who know fight who you are. survival, uh, you can So, just for instance, in the UFC, three fives, you cannot fight for three three five minute rounds with a minute's rest in between on survival in survival mode. Mike Perry, you, body, you're nobody, very upset. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, but no one's body body can't tolerate that. You know, you you need to be calm. You need to be collective. You need to. You need to be, you need, the, me and Dan talk about this on the podcast quite a lot about physiology and about application of physiology. It's like, you can't really get fit enough for MMA. You just fuck, you just can't. It gets to a point where it's how you, it's how you apply your movement strategy is, that is what is, is either leaving you enough in the tank or, you, you know, you're, you're always, you're always playing with the boundary, the cliff's edge. And you mm, see, yeah. you see the big explosive guys that they go off the cliff's edge and there's no way back. Ramirez, and if they don't bullies. Technical... They just need to win the fight yeah. in the first round or the second. And if they don't have technical and technical yeah. understanding of, of, of yeah. what they're doing and they're just fighting on instinct, that they're over the cliff and they're gone, they never come back. Yeah, I always say like the 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 capacity to reduce energy demand is so much yeah. greater than the capacity to in, increase supply via physiology. Yeah. Yeah. Because you can only do so much, right? Yeah. Um, okay, what's the what's the difference when you roll with a white belt and you roll with a purple belt? Not even brown and black, purples to whites, what's the biggest difference? They don't waste energy. Yeah. They don't chase shit you can't get. They're not, they're not, the tension's not on the whole time. They're like, I'm waiting. Oh, you move, I move. I'll <laughs> yeah. move, you move. You know what I mean? They're not, you know, they're not wasting their energy because they understand that, that they, they have they have better movement strategy and they're better understanding of, of you know where to dedicate their time and energy. I train I train with a, a purple belt. He's he's 18 or 19. He's about to go into the Marines. He's been training since he was four years old. And I tell him, it, it's like rolling with a, a human cloud. And every time I get a position, I, I pat him on the head and I say, you're a sweet boy. Thank you for making me feel like a man. <laughs> and, and so you talk, you know, circling back to the, the chat about so, so psychedelics is, you know, you, you, a lot of people will talk about the fractured ego and facing your ego and stuff. Well, mate, what the fuck does that do? You know, you're, you're like jacked up fucking s &C coach i remember the day i remember the day i went down i won't do the numbers thing in the gym but i was pretty fucking strong i yeah. was pretty fucking strong at 85 kilos i was pretty strong pretty powerful i went down to leicester shoot fighters nathan leverton would have been 63 kilos in a rainstorm and <laughs> it was a bloodbath 40 i think i probably had about 40 seconds where i was just like and I could, you couldn't move and that was done arm bars fucking cack, cack, Katakatami, also, I was just done, and I was like, oh, I found the promised land. Paradigm shift. I found the promise. Yeah, it's a hundred percent paradigm shift. And that facing yourself, like I obviously I thought I was tough. You know, I could move weights, right? So obviously yeah. I was tough. Boards don't hit then, back. <laughs> yeah, and then like you go down there, and you know you're, you're effectively facing your own ego. And even even now, so I dropped out of the sport pretty much when I sort of when I did a little bit in Australia, did a little bit in Japan, did, my friend Dean Amasinger came over, we did some when he was over, but the boys who were back here, they were full time for nine years while I was away. So I yeah. come back, having hit a bag for nine years, and Jimmy Warled is like, holy shit, what's happened to him? He's, yeah. he's in, like, he's PhD level now. Yeah. Like, even probably more, like, he's, he's fully PhD level in, 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 in combat, and it's just, you know, it's incredible. Like I've had to read, I've had to reassess who, who I am and what my relationship with combat sports. I'm like, mm. fucking, I'm below a white belt right now compared to Jimmy. It's crazy. I, I should give you uh, public credit. You're, uh, you're probably one of the, the pivotal reasons why I'm such a jujitsu nose today. Yeah, you should add I, some, add some yeah. punching. No, 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 I kind of, I kind of gave up by accident rugby when I yeah. when I moved to Japan just because the work schedule. And I was thinking about, I said, oh, maybe do jujitsu. And yeah. you said, yeah, go to Axis. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think I think I I know. Like it's funny. Uh, it's a bit of a thing to do in S and C coaches is doing jiu jitsu now, and it's become a yeah. bit of a trend. But mate, it's a fucking great. Not all not all trendy trends are bad things. Do you know what I mean? It's, I think it will massively help S and C coaches understand mechanical strength and power and application of strength and power. It certainly did for me, and and I, I see the transfer now in speed training and what have you that's obviously become much more prevalent through our career you know we barely barely really spoke about it in the in the early days and now it's you know the the mainstay of the program um but I see that you know I, I talked to Jonas and, and what have you and they're talking about application of 
mechanical strength and power. And I, I talk to my jiu-jitsu friends and they're, they're talking about, not in the same terms, but they're talking about application of your strength and power, not, not just, you know, amping up your strength and power in the gym. So mechanically, you know, you've got loads of it. We can't mm-hmm. use it. Then, you know, fucking good, good luck on the mat. Because it ain't yeah. going to work. It might work for a little bit, but it ain't going to work long term. Yeah. Give me a yeah. plug, bro. Where can people find you? Uh, so a few things. So fullreptile.co.uk is our clothing website. So we have all kinds of stuff. I always see you repping your uh, Raptors hat. Love it. So all kinds of stuff. We've just we've just uh, dropped a few of uh, these Rough House <laughs> sweatshirts and T-shirts. So Rough House, for, the, for guys that aren't in MMA, Rough House 1.0 was the original, original team. That was Dan Hardy. Paul Daly, Jimmy Wallhead, they all came through, Andre Winner, they all came through the early 2000s on the UFC scene and, you know, pretty, pretty prominent in the UK, probably strongest team coming out of the UK. Now we're all old as shit, so we're all coaching and I think there might a few of the boys might have a couple more. I think um, Dan's called out Tyron Woodley for a boxing match and I think that might happen. That's looking uh, that's looking good. But now obviously we're all coaching. Jimmy's we're coaching Rough House 2.0. So it's been um it's been revitalized and we've got some re- young, like good talent coming through, guys that guys are gonna figure in the next few years. And you know, you'll see them, you'll see them in the next few years. So that's that's what's going on there. If you jump on YouTube and go to full just type full reptile, there is masses and masses of content. There's Dan's analysis show, The War Room, which is like I honestly, I said we're 140,000 subscribers, but if you're into MMA, like fucking millions of people should be subscribed to watch Dan's in-depth war room. Like it's, it's, it's gold. Uh, we have a podcast, me and him do a pick show every week where we just chat about the up, up and coming UFC card. There's one championship, there's Bellator stuff on there. There's masses and masses on there. And um, Rough House and Centered, which is obviously... Uh, yeah, it's a little bit niche. It's not for moms. Fucking yeah. loves yeah. that. He loves right. it. And it's just basically that our, our boys just follow us around in, during training and there's loads of shit talk. When it first started, it was 99% shit talking. And then as everyone's calmed down, the cameras are there. It's now becoming there's much more about what's happening in the pro squad. Dan and Jimmy are coaching in there. There's some real good, there's real good stuff. The, the one that goes on the YouTube is a little bit shorter but if you want the extended version, we also have a Patreon channel that um, it just has more coaching on there so that you can, you know, it's not, I don't think it's fair to Jimmy and Dan to give all that stuff away for free because it's some, you know, they've took years yeah. and years to, to, to glean that and put it into a system. So for three, three, three pounds a month, you can get, which That's I think nice. is pretty reasonable for that, for that content. And uh, there's a bit of shit talking and, Every now and again, you see me getting my head stoved in. So that's probably worth three pound a month anyway. Muhammad Ali. <laughs> yeah, that was the peak. It's all been downhill from there. And uh, you're on Instagram. Is it Fighter Strength still? No, I think it's Oli. I think it's Ollie Richardson. Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. Awesome. Yeah, I think it's Ollie. Uh, Twitter Twi- is Fighter Strength. Awesome. Thanks, yeah. bro. Yeah, all good, man. All good. Thank you. Uh, play-